Good evening from Brussels, from the European summit, where Boris Johnson declared earlier today that he'd struck a new Brexit agreement with the European Union, a great new deal, in his words, that takes back control. But crucially, the deal still needs the approval of both the UK and European parliaments. And at Westminster, there is mounting uncertainty about the likelihood of MPs giving their approval when they meet in emergency session on Saturday. Northern Ireland's DUP, whose support Boris Johnson needs, have already rejected it. And Labour says that this deal is much worse for the UK than the one negotiated by Theresa May. Well, the deal says that if the UK leaves on the 31st of October, it will pay around £33 billion to the EU in a so-called divorce bill. It says EU and UK citizens will retain their residency and social security rights. And it says there will be a period until at least the end of December 2020 where the UK will still abide by the EU's rules to give time to negotiate new trading arrangements. But there is still deep concern in some quarters about the impact of the deal on Northern Ireland, especially among members of the Democratic Unionist Party. Our first report tonight on the deal itself is from our political editor, Laura Kunzberg. At speed, tucked under his arm in the red folder, perhaps the way Boris Johnson can take us out of the EU in a matter of weeks. This is a, a great deal for our country, for the UK. I also believe it's a, a very good deal for our friends in the EU. And what it means is that we in the UK can come out of the uh, EU uh, as one united kingdom. It hasn't always been an easy experience for the UK. And now this is the moment for our parliamentarians to come together and get this thing done. Why are you confident this can get through Parliament when it doesn't seem to be the case at home? And what on earth will you do if this falls on Saturday? There is, as I say, a very good case for uh, MPs uh, across the House of Commons to uh, express the democratic will of the people, as we've pledged many times to do, and uh, to get Brexit done. Easier said than done. This afternoon, it looked like he couldn't quite believe it. How are you feeling, gentlemen? It's only seven days since the detailed talks really got going. Hi, Not even a hundred days into Boris Johnson's time in office. And part one of his biggest job is complete. We have a deal. Words Boris Johnson might never have thought he would hear. But part two is next. Many MPs will deplore this deal. And it's not totally different to the one agreed by the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, who used to walk this red carpet. But EU leaders did finally accept that the backstop, the controversial border guarantee for Northern Ireland, had to go. There was enough political will in the end, so there was a way. Uh, as things stand, we have a draft agreement between the European Union on the one hand and the British government uh, on the other, and also um, creates a unique solution uh, for Northern Ireland, recognising the unique history and geography of Northern Ireland, uh, one which ensures that there is no hard border between North and South. Let's rejoice in which a deal has been found. But the numbers are achingly tight in Parliament. If it falls on Saturday, what then? People are in favour of Brexit or against Brexit. It's really not the matter. This is now if we are going to have a deal or a no deal. What happens if this doesn't pass through Parliament? But I'm not in charge of the parliamentary ratification in, in Britain. That's the job of the voice. Do you believe that it will? I, I, I hope it will. I'm convinced it will. But it has to. It has to, but if it doesn't... Anyway, there will be no prolongation. There will be no prolongation, no, no delay. Could, could there be an extension? No delay? Even if the deal falls? Not if the opposition's got anything to do with it. And we believe the deal he's proposed is heading Britain in the direction of a deregulated society with a sell-off of national assets to American corporations. So, as it stands, we cannot support this deal and will oppose it in Parliament on Saturday. Reaching a new deal, solving the political conundrums with Brussels, is by any measure a big political achievement. The EU has moved in ways that just a couple of weeks ago they swore publicly would simply never happen. But to reach there... Boris Johnson has, of course, had to compromise too. So he runs smack into the very next problem. Because a deal that works for this town might not work for Parliament, where there's a vital vote in two days' time. MPs who fear the consequences of the deal are talking, plotting perhaps to block it. 
not least Boris Johnson's supposed unionist allies. In order to avoid trying to get an extension, he has been too eager by far to get a deal at any cost. And uh, the fact of the matter is that if he held his nerve and held out, he would, of course, got yeah. better concessions which kept the integrity, both economic and constitutional, of the United Kingdom. Other Brexiteers dangling their support. I'm reserving my position on this because I really want to read what's in it, because we were told by the government throughout in discussions that certain concerns were being met within these, uh, this agreement, and I just want to make sure that that's the case. And the parties who want to stay in the EU will work together to stop it happening. He's actually managed to uh, negotiate something that is even worse for our economy than what Theresa May had put forward. We're talking about an act of economic vandalism which would be worse for the economy than the financial crash. It's hard to imagine a deal that could be worse for Scotland. It's worse even than Theresa May's deal. It takes Scotland out of the EU, out of the single market, out of the customs union, all against our will. If his political enemies win, Westminster will try to send Boris Johnson packing straight back to Brussels to ask for a delay. What would happen then? Is this the end of the road for a deal? If this deal doesn't pass through Parliament, is this as far as the EU is prepared to go? Is this finally the final deal? Visibly, not something they want to contemplate. Don't ask a question that doesn't arise, the negotiator said. It's a hypothesis, but one that might soon be true. Not what Boris Johnson or his apparent new friends want to think about tonight. But they may all want to enjoy this while it lasts. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Brussels. Well, with me is our Europe editor, Katja Adler, who, of course, has been following every twist and turn in this uh, Brexit story. And I'm just wondering today, Katja, what your take is on the fact that they've agreed this deal? They're very relieved about that. And yet, how nervous are they about what's going on at Westminster in two days' time? And do they have a plan in case that is not going according to plan? I thought the body language in there, Hugh, was really interesting. Because if you have a look at Boris Johnson with the EU leaders, there was a lot of backslapping, there was lots of bonhomie. And it completely belies the fact that underneath, those EU leaders are very sceptical when the Prime Minister said to them, I've got the numbers in Parliament to pass this deal. We got a whiff of that from Michel Barnier, the EU's chief Brexit negotiator. He said the Prime Minister says he has the numbers and we must believe him. But believe him, they don't really. Up their sleeve, of course, is the possibility of another Brexit extension. EU leaders today were very coy about that. They're not enthusiastic about the idea and they want to keep the pressure up on MPs to really focus their minds. But if this deal, like Theresa May's deal agreed with EU leaders, fails to get through the House of Commons, and if there were a request from the UK for another Brexit extension, then these EU leaders, after three years of Brexit process, two Brexit deals are not going to turn around and say no to the UK if this extension would be for a general election, a second referendum or a referendum on this deal. Okay, Katja, again, thanks very much. Katja Adler there, our Europe editor, with the latest thoughts on what's going on. Well, now that uh, Boris Johnson has agreed a, a deal here in Brussels, all eyes, as I've just mentioned, will be on Westminster, where MPs will gather on a Saturday for the first time in nearly 40 years to consider the agreement that he's achieved. Everyone seems to agree that the result in the Commons is uh, expected to be very close. Our deputy political editor, John Pienaar, has been examining some of the detail. Well, a plan that pleased everyone was never going to happen. Boris Johnson calls this one an excellent deal, though for Remainers it's the worst yet. It takes mainland Britain out of the EU trading bloc and allows the whole UK to strike trade deals which they fear would leave us worse off than in the EU. For the DUP and their staunch unionist allies, the big sticking point has been how to keep Northern Ireland inside those trade deals while avoiding customs checks north or south that could inflame old tensions. The DUP doesn't like it, but the new plan is for an east-west customs border. All north-south trade would be duty-free, no checks or taxes. But the DUP hates the plan for checks on all goods from the British mainland to Northern Ireland. Why? Well, take a car, say. Customs would need to know if it's for sale in Northern Ireland, no taxes to pay, or if it's heading for the Republic and into the EU. Because if some components came from outside the EU, there could be taxes to pay to Brussels. 
So with Northern Ireland being treated differently, the deal accepts the need for agreement from its politicians. A simple majority vote at the still suspended Stormont Assembly could decide to tear up the plan and let Northern Ireland be treated the same as the rest of the UK. The DUP think it's better to have a majority of both them and nationalists, which would allow them to have, in effect, a veto. So what's next? Can Boris Johnson win the vote? The struggle moves now back to Westminster and a confrontation in the Commons, where the numbers must surely make Boris Johnson's head spin. To win a vote, he needs 320 votes. If the DUP's 10 MPs won't back him, some of his 287 Tories would likely rebel too. So the PM needs votes from among Labour MPs and some former Tory independents. And there's another big complication. Remain parties like the Lib Dems and the SNP could soon join MPs on both sides in a big push for another Brexit referendum. And if Jeremy Corbyn tells Labour to back a so-called people's vote, it could make the government's job a lot harder. That was John Pienaar there with uh, his analysis and as we've been reporting so many times over the past few years, one of the main Brexit challenges has been uh, agreeing the future of the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Our island correspondent Emma Vardy has spent the day in Belfast to gauge how perceptions of identity have been a powerful factor. Like a patchwork quilt, Belfast is imprinted with reminders of Northern Ireland's dual identity. While nationalists have fought for closer ties to the EU, unionist politicians have pulled the other way. Today's deal divides these communities again. I think it's ridiculous that the unionist community is holding everybody to ransom. They just don't think no. of anybody but themselves. Anything Catholics like, they automatically are against it. It doesn't matter what it is. In unionist areas of this city, it's viewed very differently. For those who identify as British, the arrangements for trade in the Brexit deal strike at something deeper. A fear that closer alignment with Ireland and the EU undermines Northern Ireland's very place in the United Kingdom itself. Hi Emma, nice Hi. to meet you. It's at the back of their minds, no matter what it looks like, there's always that fear. The enemies are to the south of them, the enemies are to the east of them, the enemies are right in the heart in the Northern Ireland Assembly. And when you live in that fear, it's almost like a permanent paranoia. When you live with that all the time, you, you, you tend not to see rainbows, you just see thunder. The New Deal could end three years of uncertainty for Northern Ireland's businesses. Companies have often found themselves caught in the middle amidst a bitter political divide. I am proud to be British, uh, but I'm running a business. John McCann runs one of many farming and food companies that believe if this Brexit deal fails, their supply chain will no longer work. Uh, my staff are demoralised. Uh, we can't plan for the future. The DUP argue they're digging in very hard against this deal to protect business for Northern Ireland. The DUP um, are certainly not helping us. The Brexit deal requires Northern Ireland to stay in sync with some EU rules to avoid checks on the border. It gives Stormont a vote on whether these arrangements should continue. But the Assembly hasn't sat for more than two and a half years since power sharing collapsed. A symbol itself of Northern Ireland's irreconcilable divides. Emma Vardy, BBC News, Belfast. Well, during the day, some business leaders have been expressing what they call their guarded relief at news of a deal. Uh, and the response of the financial markets has been broadly positive. So let's talk to our economics editor, Faisal Islam, who's at the annual International Monetary Fund meeting in Washington. Faisal, let's talk about business um, reaction and reaction in the financial markets to today's news. What's your assessment of that? Well, in a place like this, full of finance ministers and bankers, certainly the sense is relief that one of the big clouds on the world economy might be lifting. But the economic destination implied by the papers signed where you are in Brussels is importantly different from the direction of travel we saw a year ago. And that's because Boris Johnson wants the full freedom to sign trade deals with the likes of the US. But that has an implication in terms of a more distant relationship with the European Union. And that has consequences for manufacturers, for example. They had been promised 
that car manufacturers that rely on no checks on the origin of their parts, uh, well, that is now gone from this deal. When you add up frictions like that, the last time the Treasury did the numbers, there was uh, an implied hit to the economy of 3 to 4% over a decade or so from a deal like this. Now, the Chancellor said here tonight that he won't be running those numbers again ahead of the vote on Saturday, uh, but that's exactly the sort of reassurance that those opposition MPs might require. So relief, yes, but a big trade-off too. Faisal, thank you very much again. Faisal is on there for us uh, in Washington. With me is uh, Laura, our political editor. And I suppose we'd have to say, first of all, that Boris Johnson achieved something that lots of people thought was, frankly, pie in the sky. Yeah, there's no question about that. Whether you loved the idea of leaving the European Union or whether you're one of the people at home tonight watching who still thinks that it's a big mistake for the country to make. Boris Johnson has got a deal with the European Union. The conventional wisdom here in Brussels and the conventional wisdom among many people in Westminster and at home tonight was that it couldn't be done. And he has done it. Of course, he's had to compromise, but also the EU has given way. And again, you know, Boris Johnson, who's made a political career by surprising people, even by being seeming aggressive and taking risk in order to do so, has achieved something that many people said was impossible and that matters and of course what happens next matters to everybody so he might be relieved today and pleased today um, and maybe proud of what he's done but in two days time all that could change that's right because this brexit process has been nothing if a moment of highs and lows and lows and highs and there we go around the same kind of psychodrama again in 48 hours, Boris Johnson is going to ask MPs to back this or not. And we know, haven't we talked about it so many times, there are plenty of people in Parliament who have concerns about the kind of deal that he struck, but also there are plenty of people in Parliament who want to stop this happening altogether. And he does not have long to try to get a majority of people to approve this deal. The numbers right now seem so tight that it would be foolish to make a prediction on this. What we can say with certainty is that in the next couple of days, number 10 is going to throw everything at trying to get this deal through the House of Commons. If that doesn't happen, well, who knows? We might all be back here again before too long. OK, Laura, once again, thanks very much. Laura Kinsberg there with her thoughts here at the EU summit uh, in Brussels. And after all of that, if there are still things that you'd uh, like to know about, on the New Deal here or on Brexit in general, uh, ahead of that big day in Parliament on Saturday uh, that uh, Laura was talking about, you can go to bbc.co.uk forward slash news and then you can navigate to the section called New Brexit Deal, your questions answered. Have a look at that because it covers a huge amount of ground and uh, it should answer lots of questions for you there.